Hello, this is Professor Warwath. I'm going to be uh, reviewing the slides on risk management that I went through today in uh, our seminar session. The recording from the seminar session was um, uh, not, not fully functional, so I'm going to re-record it here and now for those who want to see it again and also those who did not make it to the session today. I started off by talking about risk management in the context of product management since most of the uh, students in MEM are interested or focused on becoming a product manager. It only makes sense that you understand the, the risks associated with product development and in particular, uh, some unknown and sometimes hidden risks. For example, uh, before even going to the slides, I use the example of Hyundai Kia and the problems they're having with their uh, engine immobilizers, which were removed by decision of some product manager somewhere uh, probably for the purpose of reducing the cost of certain low, low tier Kias and Hyundais from, I believe it was 2016 to 2020. So for those years and for those models, those cars become infinitely easier to steal and they can be stolen with as little as a USB uh, memory stick. It can be stolen with, uh, in some cases, a screwdriver. And from what I can tell from the uh, videos I've seen, it can be done in less than uh, 30 seconds. So the problem with that is it's so easy to steal that virtually everyone is interested in stealing them. And uh, especially teenagers on a joy ride, they literally steal the car, drive it a few miles, crash it, and then abandon it. So it happens so many times that it's becoming a menace to society. The police departments all across the country are aware of this. They've been uh, complaining to Kia, as have the owners and the insurance companies. The insurance companies have started to uh, disqualify certain Hyundais and Kias from any kind of new underwriting. As a result, those cars can't be financed because they can't be insured and therefore they can't be purchased. It's a potential nightmare scenario, if you will, for Hyundai Kia. Their solution is twofold. One is a piece of software that alarms the car. And the second is a free uh, steering wheel lock, otherwise known as the club. So they're handing out clubs at police departments around the country, literally free of charge. Just go to the front desk, tell them you have a Kia, and they're very happy to give you, um, if they still have them in stock, but they're very happy to give you um, a free club, which is exactly what I did about two, three weeks ago at the city of Evanston. So basically what I wanna frame here for you is that risk management comes from an in intimate understanding of the nature of the business and the technology. Good risk management is active and engaged, and at the same time, an outside impartial observer of the business with an eye towards what could go wrong, and what, might mean, what that might mean for the organization. It is about understanding the potential liability that comes from day-to-day -day operations. How is the company exposed? How can the company mitigate these risks and these exposures? So beyond Hyundai Kia, I'd like to go with the story of SVP, uh, sorry, SVB, which is a Silicon Valley bank. I think many of the students are aware of SVB and what happened there, but let me just go through it step-by-step uh, step because it's quite interesting. And at first it looks like it's quite benign, but it turns out to be quite malignant. Let's start with COVID. So COVID in 2020 caused a sudden influx of deposits to many banks, large and small, including SVB. SVB is unique because they are a preferred commercial bank for many startups. So what that means is the venture capitalists, when they fund a startup, they often mandate, at least on the West Coast, that, they, that that startup do all their business for banking with SVB. What that means is, of course, payroll and accounts payable and all the other corporate accounts are held uh, by SVB, and many of those are well above the 250K threshold. So um, prior to this, of course, the Trump administration lifted the reserve requirements for smaller and mid-sized banks, which means that, uh, in essence, the, the, the requirements were loosened, but they keep in place the requirements for larger banks because that was their main concern from 2008 was the solvency of the large banks and keeping them healthy. The Biden administration, meanwhile, when they come into office, they do not reverse anything from Trump when it comes to these reserve requirements. So the um, loosened requirements for the smaller and mid-sized banks stay in place, right? Of course, SVP and other small banks, in turn, because of the sudden influx of money and deposits, these cash deposits are now investing in long-term treasuries. Now, Therein lies perhaps the seeds of their, their own destruction because these long-term treasuries are locking in low interest rates, and you will soon see that the interest rates increasing devalue these uh, treasuries to the point where if they ever have to be prematurely redeemed, 
the losses have to be incurred at the time of redemption, right? So SVB operates in parallel with all of this for nearly a year without a CRO. CRO is a chief risk officer. This is the person who would be managing risk on an active basis and keeping an eye on um, reducing risk, mitigating risk, uh, managing risk across the entire you know, banking enterprise. And of course, not having one um, is a horrific situation, especially since it was for, for nearly a year. Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve, as you all know, has started raising the rates from say one to 4% uh, in a pretty dramatic fashion. And as a result, those long-term treasuries from 2020 are reduced in book value as the rates rise. This is called an unrealized loss, which in normal times means, means little as banks could typically hold these to maturity and not realize any loss. Um, however, you know, in the case of SVB, they had $16 billion in unrealized losses through December, 2022. When the word leaks out that SVB has billions in unrealized losses, the herd mentality in Silicon Valley being what it is, was very simple and easy to, to spark a run on the bank. And that's exactly what happened so word got out very, very quickly in a matter of hours, depositors basically did a massive run on the bank, basically taking as much cash as they could out and then forcing SVB to sell those bonds that we mentioned earlier. Now those unrealized losses are realized, SVB runs out of cash as more depositors continue to run the bank. Now, what could SVB have done, right? They could have had a CRO, right, as a, as a minimum on a continuous basis instead of going for nearly a year without one, they could have diversified. And that's probably the key message of this whole presentation is diversification. That is the principal management technique for risk, right? Diversify your client base, having every all virtually all your clients in Silicon Valley basically man, uh, creates a, a kind of uniformity of thought, right, a herd mentality. Um, and you know, word quickly spreads in a very small valley like Silicon Valley. Secondly, their investments were not diversified, right? If they could have had more short-term bonds rather than long-term bonds, if they had laddered their investments, uh, if they had gone into different types of securities, they could have mitigated the risk, right? If they could have had, you know, easy access as opposed to these long-term bonds that lock up their money, um, they could have been able to uh, deal with the run a lot easier. They were focused, if you will, on investment risk right, rather than interest rate risk. So um, they were focused on managing the risk of their investments um, defaulting rather than the rates and interest rates increasing, which is exactly what happened. They could also have encouraged depositors to manage the risks rather than have the bulk of their funds in uninsured deposits. This is one of the few banks that had something like 80 or 90% of their deposits uninsured. Why is that? Well, they were well above the 250k um, threshold, and uh, these, you know, these depositors didn't think anything of it. They must have thought it was just, you know, hunky dory. Um, they could have refrained from awarding bonuses. Many of its staff received bonuses right before the, the default and right before the um, the run, and they could have basically refrained from this profligate spending, right? They could have increased their cash reserves unilaterally without waiting for the government to mandate it. Um, what else, right? Well, in general, how are corporate risks managed, right? Portfolio diversification, treasury assets should have a balanced risk profile, hedging your risks inherent in the business. For example, airlines hedge the risk of oil because oil is such a huge input and input cost into the organization, right? Supplier risks. So you cascade downward any risk that you have from your customer down to your supplier. That is standard practice, right? Whatever requirements, whatever compliance issues, whatever um, you know, expectations <clears throat> from your client to you should be cascaded down to your suppliers, right? Um, raw material inventories are shifted towards the supplier. So instead of you carrying the inventory, have your suppliers carry the inventory. This is one of the tricks, if you will, that was done by, uh, um, you know, uh, Dell Computer, for example. They would literally hold until the very last minute the inventory of the product being built. Finished goods, right? How about finished goods inventory? Instead of carrying that and having a huge, um, you know, stockpile of finished goods, have your dealers uh, hold the inventory or build to order, which is exactly what Tesla does, right? 
tooling risks, um, the tooling costs and the risks of change to the tooling could be shifted towards the supplier as well. Have the supplier pay for the tooling and amortize the cost to the unit price. So as your production goes and ramps up, the supplier gets you know, reimbursed with each and every unit that they, that they produce. Risks from pensions. I know a lot of folks don't know what a pension is. Um, in my day, it was literally you know, half, I, I earned about half my pension. And when I was then told that the company was not gonna contribute anymore, that they were going to define benefit, defined contribution rather than define benefit plans, folks like me got caught kind of in the switches between having a pension and having only a 401k. Um, physical and cyber risks are managed by increased levels of spend, right? So you're spending more on the people, the resources, the processes, the tools, uh, the training, so that uh, cyber you know, risks can be mitigated, right? Um, and of course, lastly, assigning a chief risk officer, a CRO to manage these risks on a day-to-day -day basis, right? This idea of hedging, right? We talked about hedging oil. So a hedge is a small uh, bet that's placed, if you will, that might pay off when you need it most. For example, a put option or a call option, right? The put option is the derivative instrument that gives the holder the right to sell at a specific price while the call option is basically the opposite. It gives the, the holder the right to buy at a specific price. So again, so it's used to protect against drops or rises in price. Um, and it's one way a commodity risk can be managed through hedging. So let's look at a very simple product. This is a toaster. And of course, toasters look very antiquated in many ways. They've been around for a hundred years. You plug them into the wall, they toast your bread. They don't do much else. So you would think, well, this is a simple product. What could possibly go wrong? When we brainstormed this in class, we came, every, came up with everything from a sheet of paper could cause a fire if it got caught in there to people putting their hand in the toaster and getting burned to um, you know, miswiring and causing a fire with, uh, with the grid to um, surges in the grid cascading into this device. Um, there's a myriad of issues. And of course, organizations like Underwriters Lab do an amazing job of testing these products to make sure that they're you know, as safely designed as possible and meet the current day standards. There are some regulations under CPSC, which is the Consumer Product Safety Commission. There's the CE mark, which is the European version of the UL mark. There's the National Electrical Code. There's the National Fire Protection Association. They all have expectations as to what a good toaster should and shouldn't do, right? So, um, you know, there are other legal remedies in case something goes wrong. There's implied warranties that come from every transaction. A simple implied warranty is mercantility, that this is a product worth selling and worthy of being sold. There's also an implied warranty of fitness for use, that if this is intended to toast bread, that yes, indeed, it does toast bread. Um, however, the company that builds this toaster and causes damage might be very well liable for those damages, or also for the pain and suffering, the punitive damages, the negligence in design or criminal negligence that might arise from um, misdesigning these types of products. The classic example is the Ford Pinto, where um, the Ford Motor Company literally uh, did a cost-benefit analysis as to whether or not an exploding gas tank, yes, an exploding gas tank, because the bumper was too close to the gas tank, in a rear-end collision, the car would literally explode. Um, Ford knew it. They decided to absorb that risk and to uh, accept that risk because they calculated that the number of claims from insurance and from uh, injured parties would be um, offset by the savings from not having to redesign the back end of the car. So um, they, they accepted that risk and they were taken to court by those victims. And they were, uh, to my knowledge, found guilty of what was, I guess, a new uh, thought process here in, in law was criminal negligence, right? Where you are criminally neg negligent because you know the risks, you know that you're uh, accepting those risks on behalf of somebody else who has, um, you know, in essence, become your victim. Recalls. This is a major product liability and product risk that everybody has. In the case of food, the problem, of course, is bacterial infection or bacterial contamination or any other type of contamination. It could be heavy metals. It could be almost anything. You can see that the trend line for food recalls has been going up 
over about a 10 year period of time from roughly 2012 through the end of 21. Um, automotive recalls have a similar and even steeper slope. And this is over, a, again, another 10 or 11 year time frame from 05 to the end of 16. And I can assure you that after 16, those automotive recalls continue to grow. So these are expensive. This is just counting the number of recalls as opposed to the actual value. But I can tell you Ford Motor Company alone uh, was subject to $2 billion of loss in, I guess, the last quarter, uh, simply because of uh, mostly attributed to uh, various recalls, including fire recalls associated with gasoline engines, right? And yes, that was gasoline engines, not electric vehicles. Electric vehicles have been recalled, but nowhere near, nowhere near the number of gasoline vehicles that have been recalled. So how does the product development process manage risk? Well, you start with requirements that cascade into specifications to the general and detailed design level. Once you code the product, you do unit and component testing and acceptance testing, and you link. And basically what those tests do is validate uh, the requirements and specifications from prior to sourcing uh, or this, you know, source code development. Um, that's the whole idea, right? Testing is your best friend as a project manager, as a product manager. They are there to protect you from, from delivering poor quality product. So if you don't trust your test organization, build one that you do trust. The answer cannot be to skip testing or to circumvent testing. It might sound expeditious, it might sound um, you know, a lot easier, but in the long run, you are uh, destroying your credibility in the marketplace. These slides basically talk about risk management as a project management process, right? Obviously the definition is an uncertain future event or condition that will have a negative impact on your project. Um, you cannot plan away risk. You cannot avoid risk through simple planning, right? Risk management is about understanding what can go wrong, how to minimize the impact, uh, what can be done before the event occurs, and what can be done after the event occurs. So again, those risk events, consequences, anticipation, contingency plans. The key concept, I think, or at least one of them here, is that risks, generally the number of risks or the chance of them occurring um, decreases over time, while their impact or their cost to resolve goes up over time. And that crossover point is pretty close to the, um, the production ramp. Uh, and fundamentally, what you're trying to do is get as many defects as you can as early in the process as you can, because that's when it's the cheapest time to discover them and to resolve them. If you get, God forbid, into the field with a product that has defects, you're going to have a tremendous cost to, put, to pay. And it might actually, um, you know, bankrupt the project or even bankrupt the company. So always, always, always try to find your defects early. The earlier, the better. Risk management is about a proactive approach. You're trying to anticipate problems and solve them before they become too expensive to solve any other way. You want to reduce the surprises, the negative consequences. You want to have better control. You want to improve the chances of uh, project success in the future. Risk management is about these four steps, if you will, from risk identification to risk assessment, to risk response development, to risk response control. Um, and you know, frankly, once you have assessed the risk and you've got your response, you're gonna wanna control it like any other project. So a risk uh, containment uh, sub-project is, is still a project that needs to be managed, right? The following steps basically get into the details of how do you identify risk, how do you organized risk and a work breakdown or risk breakdown structure. So how do you compartmentalize and categorize the various risks? In product development, this is the most common set of risks. These are more common than perhaps any other set you can think of. And I've seen virtually all of them in virtually every product development uh, project I've been familiar with and, and a part of. From technical requirements to the design, to the testing, the development, the schedule, the budget, the quality, the management, right? Um, the work environment, the staffing. Do you have the right staff? Are they experienced enough? Do they have the right quantity, the right, the right uh, skill set? Customers, right? Does the customer even understand what it will take to complete the project? Are they part of the solution or are they churning you into, into creating a bigger problem? 
And of course, your contractors and suppliers and how they fit into the whole process. So this is a very, very familiar template, if you will, or um, predictor of future risks on your, uh, on your product development project. Risk assessment is understanding the severity, understanding the scenarios, understanding the assessment of, of uh, the probability of those risks occurring and how difficult they will be to, uh, to detect. Probabilistically, you want to understand you know, through decision trees, NPV, uh, PERT simulation, what are the likelihoods of these, uh, of these risk events occurring. You can use a five-point scale for cost, time, scope, and quality. You can measure individual risk events with the five-point scale in terms of likelihood, impact, and detection difficulty. You can then plot this on an XY curve where the X-axis is the impact and the Y is the likelihood. You can see the red and the yellow is certainly the areas you want to focus on first. So think of the upper uh, right-hand quadrant going, if you will, in a southwestern uh, direction uh, as you solve and prioritize your efforts at managing risk. This is the most common, I guess, risk response development you can think of in terms of mitigation, avoidance, transferring, escalating, and retaining. So mitigating is about reducing the likelihood, reducing the impact. Avoiding is changing the project plan to eliminate that risk or condition. Transferring the risk means basically a form of insurance, right? Or um, basically bringing in third parties who will absorb that risk for you. You can escalate to uh, other people in the organization who can help you deal with that risk and then retaining risk, right? So this is when you know the risk is gonna happen and there's not much else you can do about it. You're gonna choose to, to uh, retain it. Um, so you know, fundamentally, if you wanna use the fire example, you know, we built uh, buildings to mitigate risk that, that, a, that fundamentally that a fire will occur. So, you know, build it out of brick instead of wood. You use um, masonry anywhere you can. You try to use fireproof materials. When you, by reducing the impact, what you're probably gonna do is have some sort of sprinkler system that says, if a fire does occur, you can put it out quickly. To avoid the impact of uh, harming people, you'll have smoke detectors so they can get out of the home quicker. So um, I suppose if you built a, an entire home and completely fireproof materials, you'd be avoiding the risk altogether because there's no way a fire can occur if the building itself, let's say, is made out of concrete or made out of some, some other fireproof uh, material like stone. So transferring risk is the equivalent of saying, let's buy some fire insurance. Let's say, okay, if it does happen, at least we'll be backstopped financially, right? So we don't have to worry about rebuilding, we'll have money to rebuild, right? Uh, so that's basically using fire and fireproof houses as um, an example for risk response. A contingency plan is the alternative plan that will be used if the possible foreseen risk event does happen as a reality. It's a plan of action that will reduce or mitigate the negative impact of the event. It's not part of the initial implementation plan and only goes into effect after the risk is recognized, right? So um, if you have no contingency plan, unfortunately, you're gonna have to make one up under the pressure of you know, this risk having already occurred. So as opposed to defining that plan ahead of time, you'll be basically under the gun trying to do it in real time, which is never the right way to go. Got a classic risk response matrix. You have an event, you have the response, you have the contingency plan, the trigger, and who you're gonna hold responsible to for that specific risk event. Again, you're back to technical risks, schedule risks, cost and funding. Um, and this is, these are very close to you know, the typical categories for any product development. Opportunity is an event that can have a positive impact. So um, in the case of my, the Boeing 767, when I teach that case, we talk about a change order that, yes, it's a risk, but it has the positive impact of improving um, the customer perception of the product as well as the value of the contract to the, to the Boeing company, it, it adds value. It's literally a change order that is a, a billable change order. So think of some risks as a form of opportunity. Um, you, know, you embrace the risk because you want the, you want the revenue and you wanna make your customer happy, right? 
There's always the, the use of contingency funds and buffers. So how do project managers manage risk? They hold money in advance. They hold uh, part of the project budget in, in reserve, as well as certain amounts of time uh, on the schedule in reserve. So those time buffers and contingency funds should be managed by the project manager alone, along with the sponsor, and be used very, very judiciously. An example would be right here. If you look at the baseline budget, this is what you tell your, your, your team. Your reserve is what you as a project manager keep in your pocket. And the project budget on the far right-hand side is what finance and senior management knows to be the bottom line of the uh, project itself. So risk registers, risk control, and establishing a change management system is all part of the risk response control process. My favorite, of course, is the change management system where you are forming a CCB, a change control board. These are senior people who review every change against your project plan, and then they uh, assess the impact of each one. They make decisions, they communicate those decisions, they implement them, and they hold each other accountable. A nice little flow chart that shows that is shown here. You can see that the change origination is, is the thing that initiates this whole process. It has to be detailed enough so that people know what they're assessing and what they're measuring in terms of impact. The impact is both a financial impact and a schedule impact. So you're looking at cost, schedule, and resources for every element of that change, right? Every change needs to be decided, yes or no, approved or rejected. And then the most important thing, and what's not shown in this chart, is the communication. Before you update the plan of record, you're communicating it to the world, and you're basically implementing that change. So why have this, right? Um, if you have no formal process, you have an informal one, which means people are just jabbering in the hallways. It's never really clear what's approved, what the impacts are. Is anyone making a decision? Are some people implement, implementing it, some people not? Um, getting everyone on the same page is one of the key, key uh, objectives of both project and product managers, right? Um, you want to base, make sure you have integrity. You want to be, make sure the implementation responsibilities are clear, the decisions are, are well documented, and the uh, impacts are well understood. Here's a simple change request form. It's a very basic form from project name to the description of change to the reason for change to the impacts uh, that are hopefully analyzed pretty thoroughly in terms of cost, schedule, resources, if there's any parts that need to be procured, what's the timeline for that? Um, any drawings that need to be updated, et cetera, et cetera. So every change request should have a timely disposition, approved, disapproved, deferred, rejected, whatever, and then have some sort of priority funding source and uh, sign off signatures. I think those signatures are essential so I agree with this change request form. It's a very basic form. It's worked for me. <clears throat> Here's the change request log. Um, I think it needs to also show the communication status, but at least this does show what's open, approved, and uh, rejected. And uh, if it's out for quote, you know what the status is for every change request in the in the pipeline. And oh, by the way, I've had configuration managers to keep track of this for me in the past, and that's been a very uh, useful uh, addition to any project team is to be able to have this at your fingertips to know exactly, and everybody on the team needs to know exactly the status of every um, you know, request against your project. All right, I'm gonna skip over these PERT uh, analyses. This is basically looking at the assumption that every uh, element, every activity on your project plan has a distribution associated with it, right? And even though, um, People assume that it's a, it's a normal distribution. It actually probably looks more like, like this on the left-hand side. The activity uh, distribution is skewed to the right. What that means is you're more likely to be late than you are to be early. So, and when you are late, you're gonna be much later than you would have been early. So in, in sum, if you look at the sum of these activities across the project, the project itself could have a bell curve, but this is certainly more like a skewed, uh, skewed bell curve. Um, I want you to think about potential ideas as to how you could um, assess risk in different scenarios and what you would do. Think about what you would do about that risk now to mitigate the impact, how you would have avoided that risk to begin with, and what that long-term strategic approach to mitigate the impact in the future. 
let's take these six or seven scenarios, right? Car companies having billions of dollars of inventory they can't sell. Banks in the US seeing outflows of deposits, General Motors, EVs catching fire, et cetera, et cetera. If you just take one of them, car companies, you know, number one, car companies having many billions of dollars of inventory and they can't sell them, you can say, well, what can they do now? They could discount those products to move them off their lots, right? They could um, move them to different markets that might have different velocities. So if the North American market's not moving, maybe you move these cars to Europe or Asia, right? How could this risk have been avoided? Maybe not to produce so many cars, right? To basically go to a build to, build to order instead of build to uh, schedule. Also, you could have looked at from a long-term strategic approach, maybe have a permanent build to order uh, uh, so that you're never carrying finished goods inventory. Everything is built to a specific customer order, which might have avoided this to begin with. So I know it's easy for, for me to sit here and say these things, but um, it's a huge cultural shift for companies to do some of these changes. Look at Tesla. Tesla is pretty much built to order and General Motors is built to build the stock. So um, you're going to find right now GM is carrying a huge amount of uh, finished goods inventory and Tesla is, is not. So Tesla is going to basically be a much leaner and much more efficient and much more profitable company as a result. So with that, I will stop the share at this point and um, hopefully this uh, all made sense to you. And um, I'll be glad to answer questions if you want to email them to me in my office and I will take them from there. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much.